Welcome back um, from the break. I'm Joanne Billings. I'm the Associate Vice President of Research Integrity and Compliance and Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of Pulmonary Allergy and Critical Care Medicine here at the University of Minnesota. I am an investigator um, involved in cystic fibrosis clinical research and also I'm responsible for the oversight of our division's clinical research program. Um, I wish to disclose that I do get research support to conduct clinical trials from both Vertex Pharmaceuticals and Renovion. I'm really honored to be moderating this next session. And I really look forward to also learning from this next session that's titled Building Collaborations in Clinical Research with Clinical Research Professionals and Research Staff for the Ethical Conduct of Research. This is an extremely important session Research professionals and staff play a vital role in ensuring the ethical and responsible conduct of research. In many studies, they may have more direct contact with potential and enrolled participants than the principal investigator does. We have two expert speakers to address this important topic, Professor Carolyn Thomas-Jones from The Ohio State University and Dr. Jennifer McLennan from Washington University School of Medicine. Each will speak for about 20 minutes, followed by a discussion and your questions. So we encourage you to submit questions through the Q&A function. And you can also upvote questions using the thumb, thumbs up icon. So first, um, Carolyn Thomas-Jones um, is an associate professor of clinical nursing and director of the Master of Clinical Research graduate degree program offered by the Colleges of Nursing and Pharmacy at The Ohio State University. She has more than 30 years of experience working in clinical research roles, ranging from coordinator, director, and educator to PI. In addition to managing operations for multi multi-center clinical trials, she has also worked in multidisciplinary clinical research workforce development in the United States and in low resource countries. She is a founding member of the Joint Task Force for Clinical Research Competence, leading to international adoption of clinical research competencies to drive workforce development and curricula. She has published widely on clinical research management, education, clinical research, nurse role delineation, and core competencies in clinical research. She has no relevant disclosures. Please join me in welcoming Professor Jones. So, you know, um, I remember once uh, running into an old, um, uh, nursing instructor. I'm a nurse. Um, and she ran into me and she said, well, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm working in clinical research. And she said, I'm so sorry you left nursing. And I thought nothing is further from the truth. I think I see patients, you know, on such a long uh, term basis as a clinical research nurse at that time. I had long-term relationships with these patients. Uh, um, so, you know, it's a very interactive sport here being a clinical research professional. So I'm going to talk about the ethical issues as member, you know, of CRPs as members of clinical, clinical translational science teams. And so clinical translational science is, um, is not only about the scientific issues, but also the um, the operational factors that go into um, enabling studies, operationalizing studies. And so some people have argued that clinical research professionals are the original clinical translational scientists. We have this down to an art, just nobody knows it exists. So you can go to the next slide. So the topic pathway things I'm going to talk about, I'm going to define CRPs and sort of their team science network and uh, define complexity in clinical research and really get into some of the ethical tensions and suggested solutions for CRP roles in conducting clinical research and managing all of that. And talk a bit about key performance indicators and really, you know, who are we doing this for but this participant? So also participant considerations. Go forward. So defining clinical research professionals, the uh, most recent um, NCATS uh, BOA came out um, really emphasizing the clinical research professionals uh, as part of the uh, overarching 
clinical translational science team. And so CRPs are defined as those non-faculty profession professionals that are really essential to operationalizing clinical research. And they include a, a variety of, of job titles um, at various levels, like the novice at level one, then people can progress up. The problem is in the United States, particularly, we don't, the, the job titles vary widely. And hopefully, you know, through some of the research that I've been working on with other um, CTSA hypes, uh, hubs, we can um, kind of come up with a standardized language of what clinical research professionals are. So they may be clinical research coordinators, clinical research nurses, um, there are assistants, uh, reg affairs, data managers, all the way through grants and contract officers. All of these people are the non-faculty teams that, that make it work. Next slide. And when you look at, about, look at navigating relationships, that I, I like to say that CRPs have been doing team science a long time, but you can't find this, any publications on team science and clinical research professionals, but we have one uh, submitted. So hopefully it'll be out soon. So, you know, you see the PI, the, the clinical trial participant, the CRN looks like a nice little neat triangle. Oh, here's my coordinator and we're going to do this study, but that's not really the whole story. So next slide. In fact, you have other staff that the PI is working with. Maybe it takes more than one person to um, manage a clinical trial. I've, I've seen some clinical trials that takes a team of six to do study visits, and I've seen clinical trials where the coordinator or the clinical research nurse can manage six studies by themselves. So it all depends on the nature of the study, et cetera. But the study, but the whole relationship matrix is, is even broader than that. So next slide. So here you can see, you know, there's clinical research staff in, in purple that they're managing and, and, and relating to, to get the job done. Um, all of this central to the clinical trial participant, right? But then in the hospital and med center and green and all the other staff, and then uh, faculty are in the darker blue. So these are the different people that might a coordinator may be interfacing with to manage one study visit or to manage recruitment into a clinical trial. And that's a lot of uh, team science going on. And so I think that that's an important issue because with that team science, there's this hidden behind the scenes um, issue with um, being invisible. One of the, there was a, an article that came out once about clinical research coordinators entitled The Invisible Hand of Research. Well, we want to professionalize the CRPs and um, not be invisible, but be active members of the teams. And in, in my final slide, I'll talk about, and don't forget, the participant should also be active members of the team. Next slide. Also, clinical research professionals um, are becoming um, more proficient in clinical uh, research competencies. The Joint Task Force for Clinical Trial Competency uh, has eight domains and 48 competencies. And it's really the basis of training, academic education, certification, and uh, program accreditation uh, for clinical research professionals as, as a professional group. And, you know, what we have to encounter is in every clinical trial, the PI is responsible for the whole thing, and then they delegate. And um, delegation plus competence equals ethical care of participants, we hope. It equals uh, fidelity to the protocols, we hope. But it's more complicated than that. And so, next slide. Some of the top issues for academic medical centers are site staffing and retention. We did a study that, um, that surveyed all of the CTSA hubs, and these are the things that came out as top issues. Um, patient recruitment and enrollment, uh, just issues in the complexity of all the studies and how it impacts patient 
recruitment and enrollment, as well as staffing and retention. Uh, an interesting thing about staffing and retention, just yesterday I got an email from a manager over um, a lot of the clinical trial staffing at a large academic medical center and said, Carolyn, hey, do you happen to know the benchmark for staffing and, uh, you know, for everything from a compliance officer to a coordinator to reg affairs? And I said, are you trying to ask me, you know, how many coordinators does it take to screw in a light bulb? And she said, yes, that's what I want to know. And I said, nobody knows. And part of it is because of this complexity. And even though there are some emerging um, complexity measuring scales that have been published about, we still haven't arrived at, well, how do I manage knowing if I have sufficient staff and how many do I replace, you know, staff that are leaving? Um, it's a very complex thing because of the complexity and in just the differences in study populations, et cetera. We're getting a little better with study startup, but it still you know, takes forever for academic medical centers to figure out how to negotiate a contract for heaven's sakes or get IRB approval. And those are gaps. And while we're waiting um, to get these studies up and running, there are populations that really could benefit from, from uh, having access. And then another um, thing that kind of popped out in the survey was issues with inter PI interest and engagement. And so in some centers, it's a non-problem. PIs are very interested, very engaged. And for other centers, PI stood for practically invisible. And so, you know, things are going, but um, is it really managed? And technology is, is, is continuing to... Um, become a huge issue. So if we re if we uh, re uh, surveyed, I think we're going to see a, a, a much wider differential with technology. Next slide. So t in terms of the complexity issues and quality uh, issues, you know, stronger now. Um, just in 2020, um, a study may be 14 months. Uh, in 2023, the average is 24 months. So that's a lot of engagement for a single trial. Also, the amendments are just totally um, all over the place. And they ascend in numbers of amendments per protocol um, as the study phase uh, gets um, a little bit uh, into the larger phase study. So Phase one, 3.1 average amendments per protocol. In phase two, 3.3. .3. Phase three, 3.5. However, it really depends on the, um, you know, the population we're dealing with. All of this complexity is certainly much higher in oncology and rare disease target studies. I have a... Um, relative who was working in um, regulatory affairs at a, at a large academic medical center and said that she's doing one basket trial that's already up to 25 amendments. So um, industry says that the unbudgeted cost of one phase three amendment is over $500,000. So it's a costly endeavor too. Um, and then the participant impact for these amendments uh, are huge, as well as for the um, increasing number of deviations that track along with the complexity of the trials. Phase one trials are very controlled, so you see less deviations. But as you get into phase three trials, a, 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 you know, you can have up to 120 deviations uh, per protocol, and that's just an average, so it could, it could vary widely. So a deviation means when you're not following the protocol exactly as it's written. And so, um, you know, the last thing you want is to have a lot of deviations because the study um, hypothesis can't be answered unless you reach your study in. The statisticians get that part. And, you know, if you have a lot of deviations, 
do all of the enrolled patients qualify as an evaluable patient? If you have a large number that can't, then they've put themselves at risk. Uh, you know, for a study uh, where their data doesn't even count. So, you know, these are ethical issues along the way. And, you know, this the complexity also just totally implodes staffing. Um, you can go forward. Staffing is such a problem that, um, that uh, and you've all experienced the, your research staff being pilfered away from uh, by industry. So the CRP workforce is a, is a community of practice, but we still suffer from the fact that most people fall into the job, okay? So this I love this picture because it's exactly, when I go to national conferences, I ask the people usually for at SOCRA or ACRP, you know, how many of you um, fell into your clinical research job and all the hands go up? And then, you know, so the, the, the experience when you get into research is um, I fell into clini a clinical research job. Who knew? Who knew this even existed? Who knew that this is a whole career path um, that could go into a million different job uh, areas uh, across a million different uh, employers, et cetera? And, and they want to know who are my people. And so often they're isolated. Uh, and so... It, it could be a real complex thing for their um, for their psyche even to go, you know, particularly if you're a nurse in ICU, that's where I was working. I was an ICU nurse when I first got my, landed my first uh, uh, clinical research job when one of the cardiologists came up to me and said, oh, I got this NIH grant, can you come? Yes, yeah, well, let me finish sectioning this patient. What do you mean study court, study nurse? I don't know what you're talking about. So, you know, Getting into that role, uh, I had no mentors. I had no training. I was just like this person, head in. And so that's sort of the realm of it. So go to the next slide. And so just so you can feel the ethical tensions that the coordinator have, you know, I'm violating the rules of PowerPoint by putting all of this on there. But this, this, this is just barely scratching the surface. And I'm not going to belabor it, but, you know, there's the whole problem of falling into it. Wouldn't it be nice, you know, in the role uncertainty and in issues with training and competence and the fact that, you know, right after COVID to, you know, um, a third of the people had experience doing clinical trials because two thirds of them quit or were hired away by industry. That's, that was a report from one of my CTSA hubs. So we're operating with a bunch of novices here. So, you know, what can we do to drive intentionality for this profession? Um, maybe going into high school and college and putting it in the curriculum and letting people know that this exists. I mean, this is the hot topic right now with COVID. We could have really harnessed that because um, now everybody knows how to spell epidemiology. There are no mentors. We need PI engagement and really a whole organizational climate around that. So we have to reduce isolation, embrace the translational uh, science teaming concept, and really um, you know, grow this profession and have equitable salaries. So I, I think we're seeing more and more large academic medical centers bringing their coordinators together who are all in silos, but now maybe can talk together and mentor each other, et cetera. People are doing multiple protocols, um, you know, and, and there's this tension for clinical research professionals between patient advocacy and fidelity to the protocol, particularly those tensions exist for nurses. So, you know, we need to learn how to recognize and plan for protocol fidelity, um, not just with SOPs, but just some, some check-ins, periodic check-ins on what, what can we do better. Um, I've already talked about complexity. I'm not going to go into that. But the other thing is the large number of turnover. We're in a workforce crisis right now. Um, people don't trust that they, they can project, progress in the job because there's so many different job titles and there's not a role progression um, 
circumstance that's really spelled out for them. And you don't want to lose these people. It costs about $30,000 to replace a coordinator. And that's just the actual costs and doesn't include um, those that, um, you know, can't do it. And then technology, you know, I, I know a coordinator once who was walking around with her source documents on sticky notes in her pockets. That was back when we had three-part NCR paper and she'd take a month to get a study visit in. Now we're asked to use electronic medical record as well as the electronic case report forms and those need to integrate together and every uh, electronic case report form differs between the different studies and the different um, uh, sponsors and so that's problematic and now we've got to plan in advance now we just as we're dealing with the complexity and the confusion um, thinking about how are we gonna manage decentralized trials? And who's gonna be responsible for making sure the people that are interacting with potential and current study participants in a more remote setting, you know, that who's who's gonna be doing quality assurance on that and ensuring um, training, et cetera. It's gonna really be a burden on investigators who are, according to the to the regulations are supposed to be personally, um, you know, supervising the studies. And then in terms of safety, participants really deserve uh, to be safe in a clinical trial. They deserve for safety assessments to be done. And you need to train clinical research professionals on how to assess safety um, issues not only recognizing there might be a safety issue in a lab, but how to talk to participants to ask uh, about different things that are going on so they can tease out whether there are adverse events going on. You can't say, have you had any side effects? That just won't cut it because they'll all say, no, I'm fine. You know, particularly in the South, I'm fine. So, um, these are real important ethical tensions. So sorry about the busy, but I just wanted to press that so you could feel the tensions they have. Next slide. So the key performance indicators for protocols are, you know, these. this is where things go wrong. Uh, recruitment and eligibility, lots of deviations with the FDA, informed consent, lots of deviation uh, with that. Um, just general protocol adherence. Um, some, some deviations occur that you can't control for. You know, if the patient doesn't come in because their car broke down, you just write it up and that's a deviation. But if you're consistently not scheduling patients at the right time frame or consistently not giving the right medication dose, et cetera, or um, getting other safety assessments done, those deviations are things that are um, are um, major and the FDA will ding you on that as well as it being unethical. Um, we've already talked about safety assessments and the need for rapid data input. And so you wanna reduce the number of constant queries that are gonna be dinging across your uh, email um, as a result of um, sluggish data entry. Um, and you've got to track participant retention, um, maintain all these metrics and do a, have a quality management plan for each and every clinical trial you do, because we're all here to have efficient, safe, uh, quality and ethical clinical trials. Next slide. So this is my final slide. I'm doing this quickly, I hope. Um, you know, the main thing is participant considerations, and this is really important. I, I heard a talk with Rob Califf um, during his first tenure as FDA commissioner, and he said, if you're doing a clinical trial and you're not including the participant voice in the design of the trial and in the management of the trial, I'm not going to even read your NDA submission. And so I thought that was a strong thing. And I think those considerations have risen to the top as not just um, banter, but actual requirements. And so you need to see participants, not just as passive heroes, but really as part of the team. 
And so recognize and hear their voice, let them have a voice. Um, make sure that we know that we're making them safe. Um, we have trust issues about all over the place. We have diversity and equity issues all over the place. Uh, certainly we already know that clinical trials, uh, we could have a whole workshop on just DEI issues um, and the fact that clinical trials are very uh, non-diverse. Um, and, you know, we need to recognize the true cost of participation. Another survey we did among um, clinical research staff across CTSA hubs was um, about satisfaction and diversity issues. And they said, no one understands the true cost of participation, but if you talk to the participants, they'll tell you. If they're an hourly paid employee, they um, uh, cannot afford to take time off to do the study visit. Um, they get written up when they take a day off. Uh, three write-ups, you're out of there. So we have to understand not, not only the financial costs, mileage, et cetera, but also the other hidden costs of participation. And we need ongoing and post-study com communication. It's horrible when we do all these studies and we don't let the participants know in some way what's going on, um, what difference did it make, et cetera. And we have an opportunity to really, there's so many new advocacy groups uh, and disease groups out there for, for participants or for patients that we need to do a better job of linking them with those um, because we're advocating for them, not just in the protocol, but generally. And a lot of times it's a long-term relationship. Next slide. And so that's my thank you and I'm finished and uh, I look forward to any uh, discussions. Thank you, Professor Jones. Um, our next speaker is uh, Jennifer McLean. Um, she is the manager in the Division of Clinical Research at Washington University School of Medicine. She has served in various research roles in the Department of Neuro Neurology for the past 20 years. She also serves as the Deputy Director of the Research Consortium for Neurodegenerative Disorders that is called led by her university. Dr. McLeland is the current chair of the Professional Ethics Committee at the Association of Clinical Research Professionals. She has no relevant disclosures. Thank you. Are you able to see my slides okay? Fantastic. So thank you for having me today. It's an honor to be part of this session. I will be sharing with you lessons that I've learned throughout my research career and various roles and pulling from my experience working as a study coordinator, a research manager, professional ethics committee member, and serving in a leadership role in our research consortium. I think it's safe to say that none of us holds all the answers in clinical research if anyone did, we would have eradicated all diseases by now, right? So it's the collaborative power of collaboration that propels clinical research forward. Each of you on this conference brings unique perspectives, experts, and ideas to the table. Together through collaboration, clinical research professionals pave the way for breakthroughs in research and the medical field. Collaboration enhances quality research by bringing together diverse expertise, and we'll talk about this more in a little bit. It also creates extra safeguards to assess and monitor participant safety. Collaborating with other research professionals helps to ensure a comprehensive approach to assessing potential safety issues, putting as many safeguards in place as feasible, and closely monitoring safety throughout the study. Collaboration often involves sharing data and findings among multiple parties, and this promotes transparency and accountability. Collaboration helps to ensure that studies are conducted ethically with scientific rigor and in compliance with applicable laws and regulations. Dr. Jones did a great job teeing me up and providing examples of collaborations in clinical research. 
she listed many potential collaborators in research, and I'd like to build upon that and talk a little bit about the foundations of collaborative relationships between study team members and other clinical research professionals. So the foundational block I have on top here, because I think it's ever so important, is shared goals. Collaborators in clinical research should have sh a shared understanding of the goals and objectives of the research project. Alignment of goals and objectives helps to ensure that all parties are working towards a common purpose. This helps with decision making, and I've found it hugely beneficial with helping my research team and collaborators prioritize projects and tasks. As we know, clinical research often involves experts from various disciplines. Collaborating across disciplines lends to more of a comprehensive approach to research questions and allows you to get a diverse range of perspectives. I've had the incredible experience of working on the NAPS Consortium since it began in 2018. Um, with, I won't go too much into the NAPS Consortium just for the sake of time, but the NAPS Consortium is studying people who have a sleep condition called REM sleep behavior disorder. Um, we learned a great deal during the original NAPS Consortium study. For one, we learned that many of our participants were high functioning in their jobs and in life, but already had deficits or abnormal testing in certain areas of functioning but they were frequently unaware of it. And this was very eye-opening for those of us collecting the data. Another thing that we learned was, well, we knew, but all of our investigators were neurologists, which was great and appropriate since we were studying a condition that's neurological based, but we realized that we could increase the quality of our research for two of the NAP study if we brought on experts from other disciplines onto the team. So when we were developing the NAPS II Consortium grant application, we expanded our team to include investigators in various disciplines that could bring their insights and expertise, including genetics, clinical psychology, people who ex are experts in biomarkers, neuroimaging, statistics, and so on. I feel very strongly that this has enhanced the quality of our research and is helping us to learn more about this condition at a faster rate which ultimately for us could result in being able to offer a neuroprotective treatment to people with REM sleep behavior disorder sooner. I've also learned from my experience in the NAPS Consortium that building trust and fostering mutual respect among collaborators is crucial for effective collaboration. Research team members need to be able to trust each other's expertise, judgment, and commitment to the research project. And I'm extremely fortunate that the leaders of our consortium have really cultivated an environment and expectation in our meetings and discussions that was built on respect. And it makes it a positive environment for people to share their ideas and work collaboratively, regardless of what their role is on the project. Open, transparent, and frequent communication is essential for successful collaboration in clinical research. Communication is important for the exchange of ideas, for the dissemination of information, and it allows the opportunity to resolve any conflicts or challenges that may arise during the research project. Collaborators often share resources such as data, samples, equipment, and expertise to conduct research more efficiently and effectively. My team at WashU is very collaborative with investigators within our university, as well as investigators at other universities and in industry. Um, our NAPS Consortium and our ACC Professional Ethics Committee are also very collaborative. I found that these collaborations have been a very positive experience. Um, however, I should mention that, especially in regards to the NAPS Consortium, it's been very helpful to have collaborative agreements in place that outline how resources will be shared, managed, and acknowledged. And then as far as authorship goes and recognition that's included on here, collaborators should receive appropriate recognition and authorship credit for their contributions to the project. And going back to what I mentioned a little bit ago, establishing authorship criteria upfront helps to prevent disputes and ensures fairness and acknowledging contributions. And then it goes without saying to please never take credit for anyone else's work and recognize the work people that actually put in the effort into the work. Not surprisingly, a key part of successful collaborations is good communication. And 
in my personal experience starting out in clinical research, it was a bit intimidating at times to speak up and communicate when I felt like something wasn't quite right. So if any of you can relate to this, I want to assure you that you're not alone. Uh, the more that I learned about clinical research paired with building trust and rapport with my PIs, it gave me more confidence to question things and speak up. And now speaking up just comes second nature. But knowledge really is power. And I encourage you to seek out opportunities like this conference to continue learning, regardless of how many years you've been working clinical research. For anyone that's a leader in research or an aspiring leader, I encourage you to be intentional with how you handle people speaking up on your study team. Leaders greatly influence the culture of creating a safe environment where study team members feel comfortable bringing up questions and concerns to you and to the group. And I also model this behavior as a leader by speaking, I've made mistakes and modeling how I want my team to handle when they make mistakes. So I encourage each of you to foster a culture of communication and collaboration on your teams, no matter what your role is in clinical research, you can help to create a culture of collaboration on your study team by intentionality. Culture is driven by values. Values are reinforced by what leadership does, what we emphasize during onboarding, what we encourage during evaluations. There's multiple ways that we can help encourage collaboration. I wanna share a quick story with you about a moment in my research career that happened. It was over 15 years ago, but it was very impactful. So I do wanna share. Um, we had a research participant that was in the final stage of qualifying for a phase three clinical trial for a sleep medication. And this participant was having a sleep study at our facility. When someone has a sleep study, if you're not familiar with it, they have a bunch of wires placed on their scalp, brain waves while they're sleeping, and many other wires and sensors placed on their body to measure other things too while they sleep. So a typical sleep study for someone sleeping eight hours, the study is about 1,000 pages of data. And each page looks like this with a bunch of squiggly lines. And this is an example of just one of those pages. So it came down to one of these pages as to whether or not our participant qualified for this study. And even more, it came down to just a mere three seconds on that page. So the equivalent of these little squiggly lines that I have circled in yellow, if you're able to see that on your screen, as to whether or not she qualified for this clinical trial. My PI kept staring at the page and he said out loud, would I be questioning this if there wasn't money riding on this participant getting randomized? And then he said, no, I wouldn't. The participant does not qualify. And that was the end of it. So my PI modeling that ethical fear reinforced in me that we will always do the right thing. And doing the right thing is more important than money. Um, it's more important than meeting those enrollment numbers and being up on the enrollment chart compared to other sites. So no matter what your role in clinical research, you play a part in the ethical conduct of research and never underestimate the impact of a teachable moment like this example my PI set for me. As a member of the ACRP Professional Ethics Committee, I would be remiss if I didn't mention professional codes of ethics. At a fundamental level, a research code of ethics provides a framework of ethical expectations to individuals within an organization or profession regarding acceptable behaviors and practices. This guidance helps us to guide people to make ethical decisions in their daily practice. A code of ethics establishes a standard of conduct for members of the organization or profession, which should result in consistency in ethical behavior and ethical practices. It also promotes core values and principles of the organization or profession. And by articulating these values, it reinforces their importance and encourages adherence to them. The ACRP Code of Ethics helps our professional ethics committee that I serve on to hold individuals accountable for their actions by providing a framework for evaluating behavior. Violations of the code can result in a complaint being filed to ACRP, an ethics committee hearing, and potentially end in disciplinary action depending on the case. Overall, adhering to a code of ethics fosters a culture of professionalism within an organization or profession so it can enhance the reputation of the research profession as a whole. 
All right, here we have the Swiss cheese model, and this has been applied to situations in various fields. I didn't create this, but I love it, so I'm gonna share it. In the context of ethical conduct of research, the Swiss cheese model can be applied to understand how multiple safeguards and ethical considerations work together to prevent unethical behavior or research misconduct. So just like the layers of Swiss cheese, and a block of cheese, the ethical conduct of research relies on multiple layers of safeguards. These could include institutional review boards, um, FDA regulatory oversight, our informed consent processes, adherence to the research protocol, data integrity checks, and professional codes of ethics or conduct. So according to the Swiss cheese model, whole and a layer in one layer of defense are not the single cause of an issue since there are other layers. It's when holes across each level of the system line up that they provide a window of opportunity for error or a patient safety issue to occur. The flip side of this is that although each layer may have imperfections, having multiple defenses of risk protection can decrease the potential for issues. So no matter what your role is in research, you are an important part in the ethical conduct of research. So I encourage you to be a layer of defense in the Swiss cheese and help to prevent errors and safety issues from happening. Overcoming challenges in collaborations and having difficult conversations are part of working well with others. The topics on this slide could easily be a one hour presentation on its own. So I'm just gonna do a high level overview of this. One key takeaway is that contrary to popular belief, conflict is not inherently bad. So I want you to reframe your thinking about this. Conflict resolution shouldn't be a fight that results in one clear winner and one clear loser. It's common for people to want to avoid conflict, but avoiding conflict in difficult conversations doesn't make the problem go away. And in reality, avoiding these difficult conversations can lead to resentment, create bigger rifts between people and cause issues with collaborative relationships. Additionally, if it's collaborations within your own study team, it can create a toxic work culture where study team members don't feel safe talking and about work-related issues. And we don't want that. So typically we go into a tough conversation thinking about our desired outcome, and it's great to prepare for the conversation and have an idea about key points that you want to discuss. For a few tips and tricks, you always wanna remember that it should be a two-way conversation and not you giving a monologue. Um, using self-reflection and empathy can help you to have an open conversation with the other individual. And reflecting on your role in this situation can help you identify what is at the core of the problem. So for example, in my role as a research manager, if I have an employee that is having a performance issue, I would wanna reflect on what I've done and could do to provide better training and support to that person before I can talk to them about the situation. Another part of preparing for the meeting is to consider the situation from the other person's perspective. So think about how they feel about having this conversation with you. Keeping the other person's perspective in mind can help you to empathize with the person throughout the conversation. And in my experience, it can be helpful to brainstorm solutions together. So even if you think they already have the best solution in mind, work with the other person and you just might find an even better solution talking about it together. Another impactful lesson that I've learned in my research career was summarized beautifully in this quote by Stephen Covey in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He said, seek first to understand, then to be understood. So this means that listening to others with the intent to understand their point of view, rather than just waiting for the other person to take a pause or a breath long enough that we can speak, Many of us are in the habit of not listening to understand, but listening to reply. If we actively listen with intentionality to the person we're having a conversation with, rather than waiting for our turn to share everything that's on our mind, it really makes a huge difference in our understanding of the situation and the quality of the conversation. So if any of you are wondering where to even begin 
improving your collaboration skills, I would say that this is a great first step, seeking first to understand and then to be understood. Taking a very practical approach to looking at collaborations and clinical research, there are a number of skills that we can work on to enhance our collaboration skills. And I say it doesn't matter what your education, your role in research, or your years of experience working in clinical research. There are always things that we can do to expand our skills. So I would encourage you to seek out professional development opportunities, training, skill enhancement. Here's just a few ideas of skills that can enhance collaborations. Most of us can probably refine our skills to enhance our communication skills, leadership skills, conflict resolution abilities, networking skills, and project management skills. By investing time and effort into learning about these topics, you can strengthen your collaboration skills and become a more effective team player in clinical research. And these days, there's so many great resources available for free that are easily accessible. I'm a huge self-proclaimed nerd, and I love reading books about self-development and listening to podcasts. ACRP also has some great training materials available, and there are tons of free books that you could loan from your local library on these topics. There are also a plethora of relevant podcasts out there at your fingertips. Personally, I really like Harvard Business Review resources. Um, and if anybody's a super nerd like me, Harvard, Harvard Business Review on Leadership is just a phenomenal podcast. I have no affiliation. I'm just a big fan of HBR. So I'll throw that out there. Um, so I hope that some of the topics that Dr. Jones and I spoke about have resonated with you. I applaud each of your commitment to the conduct of ethical research and for investing your time in this conference today. We all know you're busy research professionals. So thank you for your time, attention, and dedication to our field of clinical research. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Billings to lead our Q&A session. Thank you, uh, Dr. McLean. These were just fantastic talks, very much appreciated. Um, so one of the questions that was endorsed by several people um, goes back to what you had mentioned, uh, Professor Jones, uh, related to retention and the turnover, the very high turnover rate for clinical research professionals. And we're seeing this here at the University of Minnesota as well. So I, it sounds like we are not unique. Um, and so they were just wondering, what are the recommendations do you have for institutions as a whole, even at the department level or an individual team level, to try and really help retain um, research professionals. Um, and it seems, you know, they kind of endorse the idea that we do put a lot of education and, you know, hopefully try to really support career development in these fields, but um, oftentimes we're seeing them move on to other jobs. So just looking for recommendations. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> that, that's our uh, post COVID lingo. <laughs> um, you know, it doesn't always come down to money, but money is important. And so, uh, you know, as in an organization, at the organizational level, understanding and doing some work on um, job titles, uh, alignment of titles to job descriptions, I mean, I became a clinical research nurse. I don't know what I was really called in the HR system. I never got a job title for most of my uh, career. It, it just, nobody gave me a, a, a job description to tell me what, what is it that I'm supposed to do. It was really weird. And sometimes my PI would do an evaluation of me at the end of the year, and sometimes he wouldn't. And usually it was just like the same thing that you do it for informed consent for a colonoscopy. Here's, as you're walking down the hall, sign this evaluation. So there's no discussion, right? Mm -hmm. I think, it, you know, so I had to go find my own mentors. I think that um, post-COVID, we have a different workforce. And I think it behooves everybody to kind of become knowledgeable about that. There's a book that came out from Gallup, um, same people that did Strength Finders, uh, called Culture Shock. Um, and it really opened my eyes about how to manage people in today, not only from a generational standpoint, but from the post-national 
crisis standpoint of recovering. And I mean, I've got people who tell me um, my people will quit if I make them come into the office. So, you know, these are kind of issues that people are dealing with. So the, one of the things that our uh, clinical research professional special interest group has been working on are so, so, some of these little toolkits to develop to help. And one of them is a toolkit to do stay interviews. And they're going to actually do some uh, qualitative research to see what's going to work, what doesn't work, so that you don't just do your performance evaluation at the end and they quit before you even get to that, um, but to really um, do some check-ins one-on-one -on -one, and then a manager should be having a sit down with their staff people one-on-one, -on -one, you know, at least every three weeks. And we don't do that. We're just too busy, right? So we don't have like a, a, a conversation that's ongoing. And it's, it's supposed to not be about, you know, the method of this is not to be about, are you meeting your goals? How many did you, but it's about what's working well, what's not, what can we do as a team to improve it? What can the institution do? And the other is improving exit interviews to get a real sense of why, why people leave. And, you know, it's hard to compete with a $150,000 job, up, you know, here you've got Medtronic sitting in the backyard over there. So um, don't think they're not going there. <laughs> so, and they can kind of do remote work from a place like right. that. Can't go recruit a heart attack patient if you don't go into the ER and the cath lab. Mm -hmm. So uh, to me, that, that's part of it. Yeah. Um, and there are great resources that Duke University did with their job ladder and job titles and how they progress their people. And all of that they've made completely available to whoever. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, another question, which I think is very good, is that re research professionals bring their own expertise in health research. How can we better empower research professionals so they have a seat at the research table and their voices are heard, especially when there's, you know, big power imbalance oftentimes in the research teams. Um, and I, Dr. McLean, if you wouldn't mind, I mean, you spoke a lot about communication and collaboration, if you wouldn't mind addressing that. Sure, I'll start off, start off on this one and then Dr. Jones, if you want to supplement, by all means. Um, I think building trust is a huge part of this, um, continuing our education and having those conversations with our PIs so that the trust level is there. Um, I've been very fortunate that in my 20 plus years here, I have built phenomenal relationships with my PIs and we did have that trust and I did feel like I, I have a seat at the table. Um, but another thing is literally deeming yourself worthy of having an actual seat at the table. Um, I remember the way that our conference center was set up, like there was a big table, the physicians would sit at the table and then us coordinators would sit at chairs, like on the side, like by the, literally by the wall. Like we didn't view ourselves as worthy of being at that table. Um, and it was actually, I attended an ACRP conference and someone was talking about women and leadership and, you know, you deserve a seat at the table. I was like, oh my gosh, literally we need to be sitting at the table so that we're part of this conversation. So I think some of it too, is our own confidence. Um, don't let you, you know, don't hold yourself back um, and realize what you're capable of. But I do think that communication is a huge part in this so that you're having an ongoing patient with your PI and building that trust and rapport so that you can speak up. Dr. Jones, is there anything you want to add? Oh, yeah. I've, I've um, well, I'm mouthy. So it's, you know, here she comes. But um, really modeling that for people as well. I, you know, I've been involved at the coordinating center level with investigators writing protocols. And I've reviewed them before they were launched for true feasibility. Do, and, you know, Tell me why we need that fourth LP to answer. It doesn't seem to co correlate with your hypothesis and your outcomes. So why are we doing the fourth one? You know, so being able to set, ask those questions because you're, no one's going to come back for that fourth one when they feel better. Their head's not hurting anymore. The drug worked, you know. So, um, 
you know, it all depends. So really using that team approach would be really helpful, particularly at study design. Wonderful, thank you. So one of the questions reflects on kind of the diversity of backgrounds for research professionals coming from different areas of education. You know, you could have an RN or, um, you know, someone with a different, you know, education degree and how your team really becomes kind of diverse and integrated. And how do you, um, again, it's this idea of communication, training, education, um, kind of strategies for like making sure everybody feels comfortable, uh, no matter what their background is, they kind of move forward in this kind of uh, profession. And I welcome comments from either. So. You know, I'll, I'll speak up first and let Jennifer pipe in. Um, I, I teach a graduate program in clinical research and we have a whole different modules across different courses on leadership and, and that sort of thing. And one of the things I ask them to do is to do some assessments. You see that in team building uh, workshops or retreats sometimes. You know, what, what are your personality types, but also what are your strengths and using strength finders? Because you, you may be an RN, but you don't have a strength in connecting people, or you may be, you know, and you may be um, not so good at, at all the detail work. Uh, depending on, so it doesn't necessarily mean that your team has to be all RNs because there's such a variety of things that you do in clinical research. So you can find what niche fits people better. Um, and that may help with retention as well, but there are tools for that. And, um, you know, they, the premise of strength finders is let's quit remediating people for the things they're not great at and really taking those top five strengths and saying, how can we really take harness all of this great set of strengths across all these different people and make get us to the to the end zone? So that's my tip for that. Jennifer, you have anything? Sure. So in the lab that I manage, I've been in this role for about five years. And in that time, I've only had a couple people leave, you know, decide that they wanted to leave one retired, one went to medical school, school, and one went to a doctoral program. So we've had really good retention in our lab. I think a lot of it is just due to we've hired the most like very incredible people. And I think that is a very healthy, positive work environment. But when I interview people, they're given very clear expectations of what our culture is like. I want to make sure that they are willing to work towards our team goal of pushing this, what I view to be very important research forward as fast as we can in a very high quality manner, like skills I can teach, but I can't teach someone that either they have it or they don't. Um, and I let them know, like we've been very lucky and gotten a lot of applicants for positions we've hired for. So when I bring someone in, I let them know, hey, there were other 40 other candidates for this job and I chose you. And this is why I chose you. And you don't have the exact same background as you know this other coordinator. And that's okay, I know that. I want you because of you. And these are the skills that I see that you're bringing in. And I wanna tap into that and use that. And then also find out, like you said, Dr. Jones, what they're really interested in. So we can you know, reassign tasks as much as possible. So they're doing things that they enjoy and that we're playing to their own strengths. But it's worked out well. Wonderful. Well, thank you. I think, um... We are at the end of this session, so um, thank you, Dr. Jones and Dr. McLeland, for sharing your insights today. Um, I now pass the baton to my colleague, Dr. Susan Wolf, and she uh, will lead a panel on building collaborations with companies for ethical research and translation. So thank you. Yes.